Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government, and joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, Acting Health Officer, as well as Dr. Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. Joining us as well from the Department of Health and Human Services is Mr. Sean O'Donnell, Program Administrator, Public Health, Emergency Preparedness and Response, as well as Melvin Kathleen, HIV, STI, AIDS Program Administrator. And special guest today is Chief Administrative Officer, Rich Maddalino. Welcome everybody, good afternoon. And uh, let's get started, Mr. County Executive. Good afternoon to you. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank everybody for joining us again today. Uh, first and foremost, I want to reiterate my thanks for all those who responded to Sunday's evening's small aircraft entanglement with high tension wires near the air park. It was a unique and complicated emergency incident that knocked out power to over 120,000 Montgomery County residents. But there was actually an incredible response and recovery effort from Montgomery County Fire and Rescue while dealing with the unprecedented situation, along with, I wanna commend um, PEPCO and AUI Power for their quick work and collaboration to ensure everyone was safe during this rescue and by restoring power as soon as possible. And I'll say one of the, the good things we realized out of this is that while initially 120,000 households were without power, the ability of PEPCO to reroute the energy supply, not depending on these towers, enabled the rapid recovery. People's lights did not go back on because uh, they reconnected the wires at first. They white lights came back on because Pepco was re able to reroute the energy supply into our neighborhood. So it's a good sign of the resilience in the system here. And uh, obviously this is an uncomfortable way to test that out, but it was good to discover that there is resiliency. Additionally, Montgomery County Police, um, along with the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security and the State Police all acted swiftly to manage the traffic and to monitor the impacts on the county until power was returned. All in all, the incident, along with the Gaithersburg fire and building collapse two weeks ago, are example of Montgomery County's first responding agencies at their very best. We're fortunate to have such incredible talent and decision-making skills in our public safety departments. And we are very grateful for their quick action and deliberative approach to ensure everyone was kept safe. Uh, inauguration, inauguration day is coming up this Monday at 11 a.m. at Strathmore. I'm currently finalizing my speech and there are a few main themes and goals that I'm looking forward to addressing, especially regarding climate change and affordable housing. Since this is my last weekly media briefing of my first term, I did want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the progress and achievements we've made in this government over the last four years. I invited our CEO, Richard Mandolino, uh, on as well to join us um, to discuss election results and uh, where we feel we are in the county. When I um, began this job four years ago, I, like everyone else, could never predict facing something like COVID and uh, how that was going to impact our government, our operations, our economy, and most importantly, expose the health disparities throughout our community. Um, we clearly, you know, have never had anything like this that suddenly swept through the community and could create hundreds and hundreds of deaths. Um, but I couldn't be prouder of the coordination and response from this government and the outcomes that we achieved. Being the most vaccinated large jurisdiction in the nation, with only two thirds of the nation's death rate from this virus is not a small thing. As one of the most diverse jurisdictions in our country, we also managed an incredible level of equity in our outreach and engagement and the data proves how successful we are. And I think, you know, you all know about the cartoon character and uh, La Abuelina campaign that, um, that we created I was really credited with um, bringing this message deeper into um, the Latino community in Montgomery County so that they wound up among the most vaccinated people in the county. But while we dealt with COVID, we also launched one of the nation's most aggressive climate action plans. And we passed legislation like building energy performance standards, um, or BEPS as people call it. We amended and improved the commercial property assessed clean energy, CPACE program that allows building owners to finance energy efficient upgrades to make our buildings more resilient 
and we're pursuing net zero construction and we built microgrid projects like the new EV charging bus depot. Uh, the county's adding multiple bus rapid transit routes to encourage people to leave their cars at home and use public transit while transitioning the county's fleet of passenger vehicles and ride on buses and school buses um, into electric vehicles. And just yesterday, the council passed the comprehensive building decarbonization legislation, Bill 1322, which will require all electric building standards for new construction by December 31st, 2026. There were amendments on this bill that I thought were unnecessary, but this bill still has a significant way to getting the job done. And I'm very, very excited about having this additional tool now in the county's arsenal. I'll be signing this bill and I'm thankful to the county council for its passage. And it's a nice um, touch for them to end their session as well by passing landmark climate legislation. Over the past four years, we've been focused on preserving, protecting, and producing affordable housing. We've made historic levels of investment while in utilizing programs such as No Net Loss and our Affordable Housing Opportunities Fund to create quality affordable housing for our working class families. And we effectively implemented during the pandemic and have continued to fight for rent relief as well as rent stabilization to ensure that those most impacted by the pandemic are not displaced. Uh, we're also seeing a renaissance in our economy with an unprecedented growth in investment in our bio life sciences companies, as well as significant brown rebound from our hospitality industry from the pandemic. I know that in the liquor department, I believe they've now replaced uh, all the liquor licenses or businesses that were lost with new licenses and new businesses. So um, a lot is happening to point the direction um, to recovery for the county. And we're better use, utilizing our world-class public school system and our higher ed assets to follow Virginia's lead and to weaponize our academic off, offerings to economic benefit. I think it's important for us to you know, look at some of the things that Virginia have done. I mean, obviously, I've been very interested in what they what they do because as um, as competitors, oftentimes, and you know, we all know we we say that even though we're supposed to be cooperative. But, you know, in truth, we look at what they do and how, what are the basis of their success is. And, you know, Amazon's a great example. While, the, you know, the state offered more money than Virginia to try to make that deal happen, what Virginia offered was um, a university presence uh, next to the Amazon campus to provide the talent they needed. And that was the important factor in that deal. Obviously, money alone didn't get it. And it's one of the things that drove me to look at what we do in Montgomery County, particularly how do we provide the talent and the educational opportunities to support our life sciences industry? Um, because it's so important for us to be able to attract um, businesses here in the life sciences industry. And we're just getting started. Yesterday, the County Council approved our funding for the new UM3 IHC. This is the Institute for Health Computing that we announced three weeks ago that everyone continues to want to talk to me about. Um, I apologize that for the last couple of years, I've been able to talk a little bit about it, but not say as much as I would have liked to have said, because we are working with partners at the university and with WMATA. And uh, so we were being measured in what we said, but we are now able to announce this project it's going to be really significant. And I'm pleased with our efforts in doing this. Um, I think if you heard the University of Maryland talk about this, they talked about it in terms of this making making us the, the um, Silicon Valley of um, of health. There's going to be an enormous amount of research and new technology that's brought to bear here. And so you're just beginning to see where this is all leading. And the university is the first part, but it's not the last part. I'm also pleased with our efforts to reimagine public safety, which we were working on before the murder of George Floyd. We knew there were issues we needed to deal with when we first came into office and we started working on that immediately. Um, there is an urgency to this, but I was pleased that we were able to finalize the audit of the police department. The audit took two years because it was really thorough. It involved looking at many hours of officer video from their um, 
body cams, among other things, and going through detailed records in the in the county police system. And we've received recommendations for better approaches to training and dealing with mental health responses. The report doesn't sugarcoat anything. Uh, it makes clear where the shortfalls are, both in education and, and as well as in training. And in terms of some of the things we need to change in the academy, probably the most profound um, issue they raise is the notion of officers uh, as um, in proactively engaged in protecting communities and seeing themselves as in a protector culture rather than in a sort of warrior culture. And uh, this is an important change and it's something we've been working toward and we're going to continue to work toward. I'm very proud of the progress we made when it comes to incorporating equity into all our processes. Uh, we continue to work at this. We began this project um, three years ago. Um, we're training our staff so they can look at the decisions they make through an equity lens and uh, have a better understanding of the impacts of our decisions on different parts of the community. For a long time, people raised issues about where the county spent the money and were, each, were communities receiving equal access to services and information and to programming. And this is helping us analyze where our investments are going and make sure that we're reaching everybody in Montgomery County. We've hosted the first ever community forums in Spanish, Chinese, and soon in Amharic. So we'll be able to reach out to people in their native languages and we continue to, to do this. It was just last night that our budget forum for Chinese residents, which had a great turnout, um, involved in a really great dialogue with people and their input was very much appreciated. And I think it might've been the largest filled room that we had and there were many people online as well. So we're gonna continue these budget forums. I think we're halfway through, four more to go, I believe. Um, and hopefully they're uh, helpful to the community to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and speaking of the budget, the best indicator of the strength of a government is its budget. And we started this term four years ago, we faced a $90 million deficit as we walked into office. And now we're seeing record revenues and the ability to actually um, operate without, you know, not without being in deficit. And then this last year we were able to, um, fund the government without relying on the federal funding, which we've held in reserve for dealing with uh, the ongoing COVID issues that we know continue to exist. And we were able to uh, maintain our AAA bond rating, put record money into schools, transportation, and housing. We did that without increasing taxes. So it's very good, good news for us to be able to take those steps. Um, we've had a lot of success and I want to give our chief administrative um, Officer Rich Maddalena, the opportunity to talk about his first term from his perspective. When I began my term, Rich was the Director of Office of Management and Budget and then became the CAO in 2020. And I'm very grateful for his leadership and expertise when it comes to governance and politics. Um, before I turn it over to Rich, I also wanna take a moment to recognize what happened in the Senate last night with the passage of the Respect for Marriage Act, quite frankly, it should not have ever taken this long to get this legislation passed. I do wanna thank Senators Van Hollen and Cardin for their votes and advocacy on this issue over many years. Only 10 years ago, Maryland became the first state in the union to vote for marriage equality by referendum. I believe this was a significant part of the domino effect to this being accepted everywhere by the Supreme Court. Rich Maddalena as a state senator was the lead sponsor of the bill that became this state law. And it took his persistence, courage, and conviction to pass it in Annapolis and win a public referendum. So Rich, I wanna thank you again for your service to the county and to the state. And on this issue, your role in making our society a better place for millions of Marylanders and their family, and hopefully leaving the nation to take the same approach as we've taken. I'm now gonna turn this over to you. Well, thank you, Mark, very much. That was very kind of you. And it is a, um, a great day to celebrate um, progress and uh, uh, just a remarkable change um, in our community and our country on, on this issue in a very um, quick manner. Um, I think I heard on the radio today that in the mid 90s support for this concept was at 27% and now it's over 70%. And it happened because of great people in Montgomery County um, 
and in Maryland who are willing to stand up, push, um, and make this uh, a very strong case. And thank um, you, you for your um, leadership and support on this for um, over the years. So um, I wanted to talk about two things, the continued progress of the administration over this um, past term and where we're going in the future, as well as some of the election results. Um, the Board of Elections, um, through a, a lot of very hard work, late nights, has gone through um, all of the, the, um, the ballots, especially all of the mail-in ballots and provisional ballots, um, and gotten to a series of final results. I think they're um, actually certifying it very shortly, maybe today or tomorrow. Um, just to give you some context, uh, there were 120,000 mail-in ballots four years ago in the gubernatorial election submitted statewide. There were 118,000 mail-in ballots just submitted in Montgomery County this election cycle um, for the general election. So you can see how much voting changed in the over the last four years because of COVID, because of changes in state rules, and people felt very comfortable and comfort confident in voting by mail, using the drop boxes, and so as a result, the system changed dramatically, and you just saw this huge influx of mail-in ballots. And of course, I think we're gonna have to work with our state partners to figure out a way um, to make sure we can get the counting done even quicker um, so that we're not waiting so long for, for these results. Um, but uh, in the general election, really um, there were, um, there were, uh, very few races that were, were left to the very end, uh, certainly in Montgomery County. Um, interestingly, as a result of redistricting, um, we gained um, the access to a new legislative district, um, the ninth state legislative district, which comes into the northwest corner of the county. So um, the area uh, around Damascus is now part of a legislative district that stretches into Western Howard County. Um, the incumbent senator, um, Katie Fry Hester, was reelected, um, but we have um, two new delegates um, who will be representing that community. And um, while they're both Howard County residents, um, they're, they are both um, Democrats as well, uh, uh, marking the, um, the 20th straight year that uh, no Republican has won an election um, in Montgomery County. Uh, as an observation. So um, the turnout um, this year saw the county executive receive um, the second highest vote total ever for county executive, um, only behind the, the amount he received four years ago. So 259,900 votes four years ago, 251,000 um, this go around, but in an even higher percentage this year with 75.1%. I think it was the county executive who mentioned yesterday during his remarks to the county council that uh, last year, earlier this year, we put out information with our community survey, um, which um, in which we asked the question, and we do this survey every two years, and we always ask the question, do you think the county's going in the right direction? Is this a good place to work and live? And uh, their survey results said 73% said it was, and um, in the election, 75% um, voted to reelect um, the county executive in this administration. So um, you, a lot of people always say the only poll that counts is the poll that's taken on election day, and the results were re remarkably similar. So um, it also saw uh, um, Wes Moore um, as the Democratic nominee received the greatest number of votes ever for a gubernatorial candidate um, in Montgomery County, um, surpassing um, the Democratic nominee um, from last year by 45,000, um, surpassing Governor Hogan's total um, by almost 100,000 in Montgomery County last year, uh, from four years ago. Um, and you also saw the Republican nominee actually only receive a third of the votes that um, Governor Hogan received uh, four years ago. So um, a remarkable change in the way um, the, the votes um, turned out. Uh, turnout was actually less in 2022 than in 2018. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about um, why that was. 
Um, but considering that the county executives numbers were almost identical from four years ago, it seems as if a lot of a lot of the the people who um, potentially um, were voting for uh, Larry Hogan um, just did not come out in 2022 um, in Montgomery County and around the around the state. And it should also be noted that um, Westmore received more votes statewide for governor than um, anyone ever has in in history. So. Uh, a remarkable um, performance by um, Democratic nominees, uh, top and bottom. So top to bottom. So uh, when it comes to a little bit about the the um, the uh, administration's accomplishments, you know, the county executive talked a little bit about what happened yesterday. But there were so many things that happened yesterday, and it's an example of the partnership that we have had with the county council, um, and actually succeeded over and over and over in getting things done and actually getting um, much of the county executive's agenda um, put forward. He actually um, partnered with council member Hans Riemer on the electrification bill that passed unanimously, as he mentioned some amendments that he wouldn't, he probably wouldn't have um, had it, but people said it would never get done. It was done and it was done unanimously. Uh, probably flying a little bit under the radar, bus rapid transit and the plan uh, for bus rapid transit yesterday was adopted unanimously for phase two of the the um, US 29 corridor from Burtonsville to, to um, Silver Spring and the council adopted um, the county executive's preferred option, which is a dedicated right away in the median. So um, we're actually gonna move flash from its current structure to actually a bus rapid transit system. We had a huge win in the general assembly this year in trying to move forward with a plan for the entire county for the 355 corridor, for the Veers Mill corridor, for the New Hampshire Avenue corridor, to have bus rapid transit. This is the future of transit, rapid vehicle transit in this country, around the world. And Montgomery County is gonna be a leader. And Mark Elrich was talking about this as a crazy idea more than a decade ago. Um, on his own, going to Eugene, Oregon, right? To see the bus system that they had that they had built and said, this was something we needed to get ahead of as a community. And now um, we're probably a national leader in trying to build out um, and a, a community-wide system that will truly provide us with the public transit system that we need for the 21st century. The Farm Women's Project um, yesterday, um, the County Council again providing um, the, the um, support for the County Executive's plan to actually um, deliver to the community the promises that were made in the master plan. People talk about the County Executive and his um, well-known um, uh, questions and often debates with the planning department, but the master plan had a vision for parks and made promises to the community. And actually the county executive made sure that the developer and the county council held fast to those, to those commitments and is delivering the park land and the open space that the master plan um, included with the developer uh, on board. So we will have uh, an amazing project at the, the site of the farm women's market in um, downtown Bethesda. And finally, of course, the unanimous support for the UM3 IHC project. And it's always important. UM3 is because it's the University of Maryland College Park, the University of Maryland Baltimore, the University of Maryland Medical System, the three University of Maryland partners, UM3, coming together for the Institute on Health Computing, uh, which will position Montgomery County to um, be a leader as the executive mentioned, as I think the Dean of the University or the President of the University of Maryland Medical School um, said, uh, we will be the Silicon Valley of healthcare. Um, we already have a remarkable global center of excellence when it comes to the life sciences, and we are only going to build upon that. So um, when people recognize where you need to be for research to be on the cutting edge of this, of this field, you want to be in Montgomery County, Maryland. You want to be um, on the Red Line Corridor, what, what sometimes you might call the brain train um, because of the enormous concentration of PhDs that live um, and, and work within, that, within, within the area of the, of the Red Line from, from Friendship Heights to Shady Grove um, and where we're going to expand that with our BRT system. So. Um, really, it's time to get on the brain train um, and uh, and for companies, for institutions, uh, for people who are interested 
in this work to be in Montgomery County because exciting things are happening here. The great work that we've done um, to, as the executive said, we've got our reserves fully funded. We've got a balanced budget. We've got a bright outlook. I mean, um, I, he made me go through and um, look at the uh, the AAA ratings um, and what the ratings report said. This is, you know, these are people from Wall Street, Moody's. Um, saying we benefit from a dynamic and expanding economy, very fluent population, a growing and highly educated workforce. Um, over and over, Wall Street knows we are a strong, vibrant community. And um, I, I'm going to use the term that Scott Peterson has taught us all. Um, we have too long suffered under the thumb of the Montgomery County Sucks Industrial Complex that has talked down our community compared to our com competitors around the region, around the country. And I think what you're gonna see out of the next term, out of the next Elrich uh, the, um, term, um, and our partnership with the new members of the County Council is we are not going to talk ourselves down. We are in fact going to tell the world, um, whether it's the people on the other side of the river, around the country, or around the world, that this is the place to be to invest if you are serious about making progress in the life sciences, if you are serious about being a player in the hospitality industry, if you are serious about being a player in government services, or if you just want to be in a community that's growing, that's strong, that's diverse, that's highly educated, that cares about its population, this is where you want to be in Montgomery County, Maryland. So um, the county executive led the charge even when people told him it was none of his business, he was the first person got out there and said, we need to have a more diverse county council. And the way we're gonna do that is we're going to have a different structure of the county council. He threw out a plan that got people moving. Sure enough, the council changed the structure, the voters endorsed it. And now you see remarkably the most diverse county council in our history coming into place. who are gonna be partners with us in actually taking the taking our county, our wonderful county, to the next step. So these are exciting times in Montgomery County, and it's been an honor to serve with him, um, with the other people on this in this call, because you know, as he said yesterday, whether it was taking steps to defend, um, to keep the safety of this community through the pandemic, we were able to do that. And for a large jurisdiction, no one has our numbers, and that's because people like James Bridgers and Sean O'Donnell and Earl Stoddard and all of their colleagues um, in the public health system and Dr. Travis Gales and our new health officer who's gonna be coming on board, Dr. Keisha Davis, um, who all were out there making sure we had strong messages, convinced people to go out, get vaccinated, to stay safe. We kept people alive, we kept them healthy. And as a result, we are positioned better than almost any other place to have um, success moving forward when it comes to the post-pandemic world. So um, a great four years and another um, tremendous four years filled with opportunity coming. Thank you, CAO Madalena, Mr. County Executive, members of the media. Um, this At this time, we're gonna open it up uh, for Q and A's regarding elections and also uh, administration accomplishments in that first term. So we'll give it a second. And if you have any questions, this is the time regarding those topics. Oh my God, I put everyone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Oh, there is Kalant and Sil Sudad from WAMU with questions. Good, uh, good afternoon, Kalan. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I have a question for County Executive Ellerich. Do you mind um, going into more detail about which of the amendments on the decarbonization bill you took issue with? Um, yeah, a couple of things. One I didn't think was necessary to delay the implementation uh, dates. We already have examples. Marriott's one, uh, the Hillendale Gateway project is another, where builders are already doing this because they recognize the economics actually makes sense. Uh, the long-term you know, benefits to the building are there. And so delaying any longer or longer than we need to, I thought was you know, really unnecessary. And I particularly thought that um, allowing hookups for gas, outdoor grills and indoor fireplaces uh, 
was it was kind of inexplicable to me. I know almost nobody who, who has a natural gas outdoor grill. Most of us buy the propane tanks that hook them up to our grills. It's hardly a necessity that somebody have a natural gas hookup to do that. And the same thing about indoor fireplaces. So this is strictly cosmetic. So I don't understand why we would continue a cosmetic use of something which contributes to greenhouse gases when people can have electric simulated fireplaces or whatever else instead of a gas one. It just, those things just, you know, really did not make sense to me. And they certainly don't serve a public purpose. I, can, I don't know how many people actually have, you know, natural gas hookup for their outdoor grill. Uh, I doubt if it's substantial. And I, you know, I thought that was really problematic. And, you know, in new developments, that would mean that the gas company would have to run gas in the streets for only people hooking up outdoor grills and, uh, and indoor fireplaces. I mean, that's an expense I doubt if they're going to make because they're not going to sell much gas that way if that's what it's limited to. But I understand the concern is, is once the gas is connected to homes, other things may also be connected to the gas, but we can deal with that in a regulatory framework. So if they want to limit it to fireplaces and outdoor grills, uh, we can accommodate that limitation, but it seemed unnecessary. It doesn't add anything to the bill. It's not like it made it stronger. Thank you. And um, looking ahead, what would you say are your primary um, goals for, or legislative goals rather, for the forthcoming, your second term? Well, I have a list of things. <laughs> uh, you know, one is uh, capitalizing on what's happening with the University of Maryland and to make sure we put all the assets in place. And because, you know, we realized that this could leave, lead to a level of development in the White Flint area, North Bethesda area, that would be comparable to what you know, was envisioned for Amazon. We need the state to support the transit improvements. And we need to put in money into the transit improvements as well um, in order to make sure we can support the growth we want. Because, you know, 10 or 11 or 15 million square feet of development would absolutely swamp 355 if we do not have enhancements to our transit system. So we're gonna be working with the state to help, you know, help them understand that there's actually a link between ex economic development and transit. And you, can't get one without providing the other. And that's going to be really important. Uh, we're, you know, looking ahead to do more on uh, decarbonization and transformation of our bus fleets and you know, vehicle fleets. Um, we, we can't stop where we are. We have to keep pushing on that. Uh, affordable housing is a huge issue. Um, there was, I read an article the other day and it basically pointed out what I don't think people realize is the affordable housing problem is an awful lot worse than what anybody's talking about. There is zero chance in the world that given the county's current policies that you could produce enough affordable housing to meet the need for affordable housing. Uh, I can't even meet the need for the 50,000 households who are here today who need affordable housing and I'll just give you this, my, my staff hates when I use numbers, but I can't resist. So I'm gonna do this. Um, if we're projected to have 40,000 people come here by 2030, households, not people. And if 30,000 of those households are gonna need subsidy, not my number, but the two groups that did the housing projections number, two thirds of these groups need, 75% uh, of these people need subsidy. The county housing policy out of market rate housing yields 15%. So 15% yield versus 75% need, those two things don't cross each other. And people have to just stop just saying, you know, this is simply a build more housing problem. This is a build specific housing at specific price points, which won't get built unless we require them unless we're willing in some cases to provide deeper subsidy. So that's like just the touching, that's just a skim of what the challenges are in affordable housing. Well, we've got to start doing something about it um, because it's only gotten worse and it's certainly not going to get better 
uh, if we can stick to the policies that we have today. Um, on uh, transportation, I think, you know, getting the BRT system, not just in, in White Flint, but throughout the rest of the county. I, I laid this out, I think it's 14 years ago now. Time flies when you're having fun. And, uh, you know, it's been in the master plan of highways for at least eight years. And we've done very little on it because we haven't had the funding mechanisms uh, to provide it. So we've got to figure out how we're actually going to provide the funds and how we marshal federal and state resources to help us do that so we can actually put a transit system in place that would give people a reason to leave their cars behind. But I've had, I had conversations with the developers at the very beginning of this, and they would be perfectly happy not to have to build parking for as many people as they have to provide parking for if we can move their workforce to the workplaces um, with reliable transportation. And, you know, I'll say on the one hand, we've got a very good ride-on system. On the other hand, because of the nature of the ride-on system and that it serves, tries to serve both small neighborhoods and long-haul trips. So you're getting, say, from Burtonsville to Silver Spring, you're not just going down 29, but you're trying to catch the neighborhoods on either, either side of 29. It is a wandering and time-consuming trip. I know it, everybody else knows it. And so we need to build an integrated system that uh, builds these main lines of BRT and then takes the um, ride-on system and turns it into feeder lines that get in and out of neighborhoods quickly to put people on rapid transit to go to the major job destinations. Um, we have to deal with racial equity. I mean, it is um, shameful, though I would say this is a national shame, not just the Montgomery County shame. But, you know, black ownership of houses is very little changed, very little changed. And they're the least likely group to own a house. And we've seen immigrant communities come here and prosper here and get to own the houses, and we don't see that in the African-American community. Uh, we continue to struggle with opp job opportunities. We continue to struggle with equal education um, throughout the county. Uh, we're just opening a campus on the east side of the county from Montgomery College. Hopefully this is another step in providing equitable education opportunities for everybody. But we've got to really look at what are the factors that continue to prevent us from lifting everybody up in this community. You can't have a community that's divided between haves and have nots. And it's even worse when the haves and have nots become reflective of race. Because then it's just not the accident of birth, it becomes a racial issue. And we've got to acknowledge that. And then we've got to work at what we do to change those things. So those are some of my priorities. And, you know, it's not a small list and it's not an easy list. Um, but, you know, we've, We've taken on other challenges and we dealt with COVID and there's no reason we know more about this problem than we knew about COVID when it hit us. So I think, you know, we've got to rise to the challenge and be able to create a Montgomery County that all the things we talk about as being great are things that everybody in this county has access to. That's my goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Kalan. Uh, members of the media, any more questions regarding the first term administration accomplishments? Hey, Laura, can I just jump in here? Sorry. Um, Thank Steve. you, Steve. Steve won't yeah. with us, Abhi. Go ahead. Uh, can I say that I just wanted to return to the decarbonization bill? Um, you had mentioned that uh, you want to tweak some things. I also wanted to bring up uh, essentially that. When the utility companies were kind of testifying during the work sessions, they talked about the demand on the grid that this required just kind of studies. I want to give you a chance, I'm sure you've heard about that. I want to give you a chance yeah. to respond to kind of their, I'll just say concerns, frankly, about whether the grid can handle the changes required in the legislation. So a couple of things. One, uh, they need to start building a grid that can handle it. <laughs> they, they cannot keep us stuck on natural, natural gas and fossil fuels because they don't want to make the investments in the grid. And that needs to become a condition of, you know, rate increases and other things, just like when they absolutely failed with their line maintenance and we wound up in front of the Public Service Commission and tied their performance 
and delivering power to residents in Montgomery County to their ability to get rate increases. They need to step up and take responsibility. This is a national problem. I'm not blaming the local guys any more than I blame the national forces that are at work here, but this has got to change. The other thing is, you know, electrical use peaks in the summer right now. And in the winter, most of the houses are heated with natural gas. So we've got the capacity to produce enough electricity to probably heat homes in the winter in place of natural gas, because we're doing that when we're air conditioning homes in the summer. So it's not like we haven't sent that much electricity through the grid. Any of us who have um, gas, heat, and electric um, cooling know, you know full well that in the winter, our gas bill goes up and our electric bill goes down. And because I'm not doing any air conditioning and that's so that shows you that the capacity is there in the lines and they're able to produce the electricity. We just need to make sure that the that cumulatively, this is bigger than just heating and cooling of homes. It's going to be electric cars and electric vehicles. This is why you've got to build up um, your capacity for transmission. But I don't envision us running out of that capacity in the next few years. There is time to create the capacity and there's time to create clean energy. We need to do more with solar. We need uh, we need more wind power. You know, you, we've, we're actually talking to people who are doing the offshore wind off of Ocean City to see you know what relationship we might be able to develop with them. But this is going to require you know kind of all fronts approach to both production of energy and improvement of the power lines. But you know failure in this is just going to be an economic. It's going to be an environmental disaster, and that will be an economic disaster. It's not like we can just look at this and say, oh, well, if we don't make it, what's the big deal? Uh, all you got to do is look at what's happening in the climate right now. It's a pretty big deal right now, and it's going to get to be a bigger deal the longer we postpone coming to terms with this. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. More questions regarding these topics? No? Once? Twice? All right. Thank you, Mr. Madalena, for joining us today. And uh, I guess we'll move forward now with um, other topics in the public health update. Mr. Crown Executive. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for the questions. Um, it was good to have an opportunity to explain some of this. Um, earlier today, we released a vital update to our Vision Zero goals. Um, I was joined by the Chief of Montgomery County Police Department, Director of Transportation, and three of our elected leaders um, to talk about the milestones and the fiscal year um, 2022 report. Uh, this is not a victory dance. I want to be really clear about this. This was not a report saying job done, victory won, everything is fine. Everything is not fine. We continue to have too many deaths in this county and too many accidents, and there is more work to do. And I noted there was an article also just the other day about how you, the United States seems to be running opposite of the rest of the world in terms of fatalities. Um, and, uh, you know, some people have mentioned it today, but you know, other countries have found out ways uh, to protect pedestrians better and to get drivers to drive safer. Um, there will be money for more speed cameras. Um, there, you know, we, we continue to need them and we're going to make improvements in terms of the roadways to make sure we don't design roadways for cars to go 50 miles an hour and then try to slow them down to 30 or 35. So we're looking at things we can do to improve that. We are obviously adding to um, bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Uh, last year, a little over $100 million was spent on safety improvements. Uh, we have the first phase of the bikeway project which provides uh, protected lanes for cyclists and on along Woodmont Avenue and across Wisconsin Avenue and downtown Bethesda, which is now now complete. And one of the tracks in downtown Bethesda will go across Wisconsin Avenue and lead to a track that will um, connect with the Capitol Tra Crescent Trail so riders can ride that trail. Uh, come up to the Women's Farmers Market, cross at the light there, and then continue down uh, to the Capitol Crescent Trail on the other side. So um, these are big things that we're making progress on. Uh, by next summer, we'll spend another $123 million in Vision Zero safety improvements. And I want to thank our program coordinator, Wade Holland, for managing 
such a wide ranging plan. It includes determining the best solution for issues like speeding. The plan has to account for scooters and how to get all roadway users to safely utilize and obey crosswalks. Um, and every vehicle that's got wheels is guilty of not obeying crosswalks and not stopping for stop signs. Uh, we need to make sure that people understand that the rules of the road and the rules of safety apply to everybody. They're not exclusively for four wheel motorized vehicles, but anything people do that endangers pedestrians and crosswalks or that sends you hurtling through a stop sign into cross traffic is something that can end badly and people need to understand they're not supposed to do that. As um, MCPD's Chief Marcus Jones said today, slowing drivers down is critical. And we've seen too many lives lost on our roads and I hope we can accomplish our goal of eliminating all traffic deaths as soon as possible. And again, you know, it also calls for everybody being cognizant of what their role is in this. Um, we have to, we as a total community need to make sure that our habits don't become the causes of our um, getting into accidents. So hopefully people can be more careful. People have to be more cognizant of what they're doing when they're driving. And that's why you see a lot of the um, little poles we're putting up to square corners at intersections so the cars actually have to slow down when they're making a turn as opposed to just uh, turning around the curved corners. So more of all this to come. Um, and health update this week, um, we've not seen a winter since the pandemic started that we didn't see a, a spike in COVID-19 cases. As people traditionally get sick when the weather starts getting cold, this winter we are more prepared than ever with bivalent boosters and a high vaccin vaccination rate protecting Montgomery County, but there are still reasons to worry. Um, chief among those reasons is the so-called tridemic, which has had an early start to the flu season combined with early and high rates of RSV, which targets um, both young and old people. And then there's the lingering uh, COVID-19 threat. As I mentioned last week, hospitals across the DC region are starting to feel the pain. RSV cases are creating the kind of strain on hospitals we last saw almost a year ago during the Omicron variant, which pushed through. Uh, over the holiday weekend, capacity levels at local hospitals were sometimes reaching into the red zone, which is very concerning next week. We plan to have a representative from one of our hospitals on this briefing to talk about what they're seeing and what we can do to help. I can tell you, you know, first off, um, getting your bivalent booster and getting your flu shot would be an enormous help. That would be two big reasons why you don't have to take a trip to the hospital. So please, um, if you're not boosted or vaccinated, please get these things done. Um, you know, we've gotten through the Thanksgiving holiday, that's a short holiday. We're about to go into Christmas season and people are gonna be taking, you know, week long vacations. Um, it's a time to think about, you know, being as careful as we can be in terms of protecting uh, your friends and loved ones as we, as we go through the holiday season. As you can see from the image in this, um, the state of Maryland started an RSV dashboard. And additionally, they're also promoting a Fluster campaign I believe they stole that from Boosterama, which uh, Scott came up with, um, with the hope that people will get their flu shot and latest booster to keep these respiratory illnesses from further overwhelming our hospitals and our healthcare system. Uh, this should sound very familiar to everyone around here. We've never wavered from our message to remain vigilant and careful. As school was starting this year, we were encouraging families to stay up to date on boosters. We pushed flu shots early on. That's why 30% of Montgomery County has already received its flu shot, outpacing the state, still not high enough. In the lead up to Halloween and Thanksgiving, we reminded families to stay home if they're sick and continued uh, to push the boosters and flu shots. These are some precautions that can still be applied as the community threat level in Montgomery County remains low. We'd like it to stay low. So anything you can do, and we've been very clear about what you can do, uh, would contribute to all of us being as safe and healthy as possible. Let's hope this winter is not remembered for any virus, but instead for the work we put in well ahead, well ahead of time to prevent another COVID wave. 
finally, tomorrow is World AIDS Day. And as much as we focus on COVID, MPOX, RSV, and flu, I want to acknowledge and thank the work of the Health and Human Services Department, HIV, STI services, and all the preventive work and outreach they do. In 2019, the county was named an ending the HIV epidemic jurisdiction, along with Baltimore City, Prince George's County, and the District of Columbia. The initiative is a federal plan to reduce new HIV infections by 90% in places in the U.S. where new infections are happening the fastest. Our plan outlines strategies to help us reach that goal. There are about 4,000 people in Montgomery County currently living with HIV, and an average of 123 people were diagnosed with HIV every year for the past five years. Uh, we're encouraging residents to get tested, even if you don't think you're at risk. Seek treatment for HIV if you test positive. With successful treatments, people living with HIV can live long, healthy lives and prevent the transmission of HIV to others. Um, for any of you old enough to remember, you know, it wasn't that long ago when HIV was essentially a death sentence. It's not that anymore. But it's not that as long as you do the things you need to do. A, get diagnosed, and then take the medicines that can protect you. But we've got these tools now. We didn't have them before. Take care of yourselves. Make sure that you're not taking chances with your health. And take some comfort in the fact that if you get a diagnosis, it's not the end of the world. It just means you're going to be taking another pill. Um, ask your health care provider about pre-exposure prophylaxis, the HIV prevention medication to reduce the risk of HIV. Learn the facts about HIV and talk with your partners, family, and friends about it. <clears throat> Fight HIV stigma by showing support and compassion <clears throat> for people living with HIV. County residents seeking free or low-cost HIV testing treatment or prevention should contact Montgomery County HIV Services at 240-777-1869. And find out more about our efforts at www.doitforumc.org. I'd now like to bring in Sean O'Donnell, Dr. Starter, to go over this week's health report. And uh, also available for any questions is Melbourne, Melvin Coffin, a program administrator for HIV SDI services in DHHS. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. <coughs> uh, just going through our, our pulse report uh, this week, um, again, we are looking at the variants that are being reported through CDC sampling. Uh, the BQ1, BQ1.1 continue to make up a, a larger number of these variants. Those are um, related to the BA5 uh, variant, but are being reported um, distinctly. So uh, again, we are mostly within BA5, um, which is, a, as a reminder, the component that's in the bivalent booster. Uh, it, the, the Omicron addition to the bivalent booster. Looking at our, our case rates, um, we expect to see some fluctuation uh, over this week as many people um, traveled or hosted gatherings. Um, so uh, a lot of times during those holidays and during the weekends, there's less testing that occurs. Um, and then we expect to see increased testing when people return. Uh, so we, we have seen kind of uh, static numbers of, of COVID PCR tests. Our hospitalizations have not gone up um, significantly uh, recently related to COVID, um, but that's, there's a different story for total hospitalizations. Uh, looking again at COVID um, with hospitalizations, uh, there has been a modest increase over um, the last week in number of COVID patients. We're hoping that remains low um, after the, the holiday gatherings, but we've seen in previous years that it started to increase um, uh, dramatically in the previous years. We're hoping that won't happen this year. Uh, looking at mortality data related to COVID, uh, as we've seen this past month, it slightly increased numbers of COVID uh, transmissions being identified. Um, we've also seen a slight increase again in the deaths associated with COVID. Uh, we're not quite out of November yet, but it, it looks like it will be higher. It's already higher than the previous month. Uh, again, nothing new on hospitalization and hospitalizations and deaths by vaccination status. Um, we're still showing much higher rates for those who are not fully vaccinated. Uh, 
and, and very low rates for deaths by those who um, have been boosted and vaccinated. Looking at who is getting vaccinated, uh, at this point, about one in five of our county residents have received the bivalent booster, the new booster that's been out since uh, the beginning of September. And of our of our residents who are 50 and older, uh, that's been a little bit more than one in three. We'd obviously like to see those numbers continue to go up, and we're strongly recommending that everybody goes out and gets that bivalent booster. Looking at influenza and respiratory and other respiratory diseases uh, across the nation, there's a significant increase in the flu season this year. Um, last year and the previous year were that was well below what the annual rates are this year. We're at a much higher level um, across the nation, more than six, 6 million illnesses. It may be as many as 12 million. It is very hard um, to get um, definitive numbers uh, within these, but these are sort of the minimum thresholds that the CDC is estimating uh, almost 3,000 deaths already uh, nationally from flu. Um, and again, we're at a point where it's much earlier than previous seasons. Uh, of note, you can see from the chart on the left, we sort of maxed out at about um, 9,000 positive tests uh, per, or 7,000 positive tests per, um, per week last year. We're already um, closer to, you know, 25,000 positive tests. Um, so, uh, a significant increase in flu activity this year. And it's a just such a strong reason for people to get their flu shot uh, every year, but particularly this year. Looking at Maryland uh, influenza associated hospitalizations, you can see again, much earlier than the, the blue and green lines are the previous two years. You can see that activity was very, very low. Um, going back to 2019, 2020, um, we're still well ahead of that curve in seeing flu activity this year. So it's, it's very possible our flu season could continue to go for a few more months as it has in previous years. In our county, I uh, just want to again show you that where a lot of uh, most of these charts are um, ED reports of people coming into hospitals with fever and flu like symptoms. And you can see large, there's increases in all the age groups, but most of those increases are, or the most significant increases are in our pediatric populations, those under 17 years old, um, seeing lots of uh, hospital visits at that age. Um, when, you, when you look at uh, the year to year, that the mint uh, green line in the upper left is showing you where we are this year, significantly higher, um, you know, across all age groups for that uh, respiratory illness um, presenting to the county hospitals. So this is causing a lot of a lot of visits. Uh, if you look in the lower left, those are our total emergency department visits um, by uh, day, and you can see we're we're at a very very high level already this time of year. Um, it, you know, it looks like just about exceeding where we were. Uh, even in December and January of last year during that very large Omicron spike. Uh, we're hoping these will come down. Um, but again, we're, we're concerned because this is often the beginning of increases in respiratory disease after the holidays. Uh, again, with um, the flu shots we've seen in, in Montgomery County, again, we're about one in three of our residents have gotten their flu shot. Uh, we'd like to see that uh, increase. It's, it's very similar to what we're seeing for uh, booster shots. And again, as the state is marketing, as, as our county executive just mentioned, we'd like to see people get both of these shots this year. And then uh, again, we're, we're tracking on our MPOX cases. Uh, we have no new cases in Montgomery County again this week, um, but there continues to be cases across the state. And we're continuing to encourage people to come in and get that vaccination if they haven't and, and make sure they get both their vaccinations. Um, those are all the updates I have on our public health side. Uh, I'd like to see if Dr. Bridgers or my colleague, uh, Melvin Cawthon have anything that they'd like to add um, before we go to questions. Thanks, Ms. O'Donnell. No comments from me available for questions that is needed. As well, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stoddard, do you have any initial remarks? No? Yeah, I've got a lot of questions. 
Okay, so we're ready to open it up for the Q&A portion of this presentation. Members of the media, you can use the chat or just raise your hand here on the Zoom uh, link. And uh, we don't have any questions at this moment, but uh, we'll give you a second or two. When you're ready, let us know. Sorry, Laura. Steve, right. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Go ahead. I'll get better at this. Um, this actually isn't a public health question. I wonder if Dr. Stoddard can field it and then one can chime in. But um, obviously, it's been a bit of time since this miraculous rescue of this plane. And I, I find it interesting, Dr. Stoddard, you, know, you tweeted out there's no manual for what had occurred. But in the short time that has kind of elapsed, have you learned anything? You know, I'm just curious what you've kind of taken away from what's a very kind of unique situation and how it's going to prepare you and I guess others for incidents like this down the line. Yeah, so I actually thought about this a lot, uh, Steve. Um, uh, what I would say is the biggest takeaway, and this is not something that's unique to this event, but certainly is a lesson that we continue to learn is uh, relationships matter. And so, while there wasn't a manual for how you do a, conduct a rescue of a plane that was essentially pinned in a high tension electrical uh, tower, there was the, the 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 technical rescue team at Fire Rescue does train on high on tower electrical tower rescues. They also train on plane crashes. Uh, this is not the first time Pepco or AUI Power have seen planes into electrical wires. It was really the, you know, the, the, the part that was really impressive to me about this whole situation is, was that they came together, they applied elements of those various individual things that they had experience with, but did them in a unique way to reflect the unique way this incident played out. And that all happened at, on the ground. I stood there and watched as the partnership was, you know, based on relationships, came together very quickly. They all were, were seamless in their in, in their assessment of the priorities, which was to rescue the two individuals in the plane as quickly and safely as possible, while simultaneously protecting the lives and safety of those responders who would be conducting the rescue. And so I think to me, you know, there was a, a gentleman from Pepco by the name of Pete Peterson, who's been a long time part, I've known him for over a decade at this point. And he's been the lead for Pepco, working with the county on preparedness issues. He was on scene that night, so I had an existing relationship with him, as did the fire chief. It allowed for a seamless conversation. We could have really honest conversations about where things were at, how long it was going to take for certain things to occur. And so I think that those relationships that were built long in advance of this incident having happened were absolutely critical. And they speak to the fact that, you know, whether it's on a situation that's exactly similar to what you're dealing with, practicing and preparing in face-to-face in, in -face, uh, routine meetings is uh, there's no substitute for that. You can't just, um, you know, you can't just read a manual. You can't just read uh, um, a plan on how you're going to respond, you know, doing exercises, doing joint activities where you get to know the people you're going to be responding with are critical. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Members of the media, any other questions? No more questions for the officials this afternoon? Okay, I guess we're done for today. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.